Chapter Forty One of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Story Telling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Story Telling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Kentaro, the Golden Boy from Japan. Once upon a time, a poor widow and her little boy lived in a cave in the midst of a great forest. The little one's name was Kentaro, the Golden Boy. He was a sturdy fellow with red cheeks and laughing eyes. He was different from other boys. When he fell down, he sang cheerily. If he wandered away from the cave, he could always find his way home again, and while he was yet very small, he could swing a heavy axe in circles round his head. Kentaro grew to be ten years old and a handsome manly lad he was then his mother looked at him often and sighed deeply must my child grow up in this lonely forest thought she sadly will he never take his place in the world of men alas alas but kintaro was perfectly happy the forest was full of his playmates every living thing loved him when he lay on his bed of ferns the birds flew nestling to his shoulder and peeped into his eyes. The butterflies and moths settled on his face and trod softly over his brown body. But his truest friends were the bears that dwelt in the forest. When he was tired of walking, a mother bear carried him on her back. Her cubs ran to greet him and romped and wrestled with him. Sometimes Kintaro would climb up the smooth bark monkey tree and sit on the topmost bough and laugh at the vain efforts of his shaggy cub friends to follow him. Then came the bear's supper time and the feast of golden liquid honey. Now it happened, one summer, that there was to be a great day of sports for the forest creatures soon after dawn a gentle-eyed stag came to waken kintaro the boy with a farewell kiss to his mother and a caress to the stag leaped on his friend's back and wound his arms around his soft neck and away they went with long noiseless bounds through the forest uphill across valleys through thickets they bounded until they reached a leafy spot in a wide green glade near a foaming cataract there the stag set kintaro down and the boy seated himself on a mossy stone and began to whistle sweetly immediately the forest rustled with living things the songbirds came swiftly to his call the eagle and the hawk flew from distant heights the crane and the heron stepped proudly from their hyacinth pools and hastened to the glade. All Kintero's feathered friends flocked thither and rested in the cedar branches. Then through the undergrowth came running the wolf, the bear, the badger, the fox, and the marten, and seated themselves around Kintero. They all began to speak to him. He listened as they they told their joys and sorrows, and he spoke graciously to each, for Kintero had learned the language of beasts, birds, and flowers. And who had taught Kintero all this? The Tengus, the wood elves, and even while he was listening to the forest creatures, the Tengus themselves came rumbling, came tumbling out of the trees or popping up from behind stones very strange little elves they were each had the body of a man the head of a hawk powerful claws and a long long nose that usually trailed on the ground and every little tengu wore on his feet tiny stilt like clogs 
all these queer wood elves came toward Kintero, walking very proudly with their arms crossed, heads well thrown back, and long noses held erect in the air. At their head was the chief Tengu, very old, with a gray beard and sharp beak. The chief Tengu seated himself beside Kintero on the mossy stone, and waved a seven-feathered fan in the air. Immediately the sports began. The young Tengus were fond of games. They found their long noses most useful. They now fenced with them, and balanced bowls full of goldfish on them. Then two of the Tengus straightened their noses, and joined them together, and so made a tight rope. On this a young Tengu, with a paper umbrella in one hand, and leading a little dog with the other, danced and jumped through a hoop. And all the time an old Tengu sang a dance song, and another Tengu beat time with a fan. Kentaro cheered loudly, and clapped his hands, and the beasts and birds barked, hissed, growled, or sang for pleasure. So the morning passed swiftly and delightfully, and the time came for the forest animals to take part in the sports. They did so running, leaping, tumbling, and flying. Last of all stood up a great father bear to wrestle with Kintero. Now the boy had been taught to fight by his friends the Tengus, and he had learned from them many skillful tricks. So he and the bear gripped with each other and began to wrestle very hard. The bear was powerful and strong and his claws like iron, but Kintero was not afraid. Backward and forward they swayed and struggled, while the Tengus and the forest creatures sat watching. Now it happened that the great hero Reiku was just returning from slaying many horrible ogres and hags. His way lay through the forest, and at that moment he heard the noise of the wrestling. He stopped his horse and peered through the trees into the glade. There he saw the circle of animals and little Tengus, and Kintero struggling with the powerful bear. Just at that moment the boy, with a skillful movement, threw the clumsy creature to the ground. I must have that boy for my son, thought Reiku. He will make a great hero. He must be mine. So he waited until Kintero had mounted the stag, and bounded away through the forest. Then Reiku followed him on his swift steed to the cave. When Kintero's mother learned that Waiku was the mighty warrior who had slain the ogres and hags, she let him take her son to his castle. But before Kintero went, he called together all his friends, the Tengus, the birds, and the beasts, and bade them farewell in words that they remember to this day. His mother did not follow her son to the land of men, for she loved the forest best. But Kintero, when he became a great hero, often came to see her in her home, and all the people of Japan called him Kintero, the golden boy. End of chapter 41. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 42 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott The Flower Fairies from China Once upon a time, high on a mountainside, there was a place where many beautiful flowers grew, mostly peonies and camellias. A young man named Tuang, who wished to study all alone, built himself a little house nearby. One day he noticed from his window a lovely young girl dressed in white, wandering about among the flowers. He
he hastened out of the house to see who she was but she ran behind a tall white peony and vanished huang was very much astonished and sat down to watch soon the girl slipped from behind the white peony bringing another girl with her who was dressed in red they wandered about hand in hand until they came near huang when the girl in red gave a scream and together the two ran back among the flowers their robes and long sleeves fluttering in the wind and scenting all the air huang dashed after them but they had vanished completely that evening as huang was sitting over his books he was astonished to see the white girl walk into his little room with tears in her eyes she seemed to be pleading with him to help her huang tried to comfort her but she did not speak then sobbing bitterly she suddenly vanished this appeared to huang as very strange however the next day a visitor came to the mountain who after wandering among the flowers dug up the tall white peony and carried it off huang then knew that the white girl was a flower fairy and he became very sad because he had permitted the peony to be carried away later he heard that the flower had lived only a few days at this he wept and going to the place where the peony had stood watered the spot with his tears while he was weeping the girl in red suddenly stood before him wringing her hands and wiping her eyes alas cried she that my dear sister should have been torn from my side but the tears huang that you have shed may be the means of restoring her to us having said this the red girl disappeared but that very night huang dreamed that she came to him and seemed to implore him to help her just as the white girl had done in the morning he found that a new house was to be erected close by and that the builder had given orders to cut down a beautiful tall red camellia huang prevented the destruction of the flower and that same evening as he sat watching the camellia from behind its tall stem came the white girl herself hand in hand with her red sister huang said the red girl the king of the flower fairies touched by your tears has restored my white sister to us but as she is now only the ghost of a flower she must dwell forever in a white peony and you will never see her again at these words huang caught hold of the white girl's hand but it melted away in his and both the sisters vanished forever from his sight in despair he looked wildly around him and all that he saw was a tall white peony and a beautiful red camellia after that huang pined and fell ill and died he was buried at his own request by the side of the white peony and before very long another white peony grew up very straight and tall on huang's grave so that the two flowers stood lovingly side by side end of chapter forty two recording by phone chapter forty three of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins alcott chapter forty three the fairy island from cornwall in ancient days in the land of wales there was a blue lake on a high mountain no one had ever seen a bird fly near it and over its waves came faint strains of delicious music that seemed to float from a dimly seen island in its centre no one had ever ventured to sail on its water for everyone knew that it was the abode of the telwith teg the water fairies it happened one lovely summer day that a hunter was wandering along the margin of the lake and found himself before an open door in a rock he entered and walked along a dark passage that led downward he followed this for some time and suddenly found himself passing through another door that opened on the mysterious lovely island the home of the telworth teg all around him was a most enchanting garden where grew every sort of delicious fruit and fragrant flower the next moment a number of fairies advanced toward him and graciously welcomed him to their abode they bade him eat as much fruit as he wished and pick the flowers but told him not to take anything away with him 
All day he remained on the island, listening to the most ravishing music and feasting and dancing with the fairies. When it came time for him to leave, he hid a flower in his bosom before he wished to show it to his friends at home. He then said farewell to the fairies and returned through the dark passage to the margin of the lake. But when he put his hand in his bosom to pull out the flower, he found, to his amazement, that it had vanished. At the same moment he fell, insensible, to the ground. When he came to himself, the door in the rock had disappeared, and though he searched day after day, he never again found the passage to the fairy island. End of chapter 43、Chapter、44。The Four Leaved Clover from Cornwall. Some years ago, in Cornwall, there was a farmer who owned a fine red cow named Rosie. She gave twice as much milk as any ordinary cow. Even in winter, when other cows were reduced to skin and bone, Rosie kept in good condition and yielded richer milk than ever. One spring, Rosie continued to give plenty of milk every morning, but at night, when Molly the maid tried to milk her, She kicked a bucket over and galloped away across the field. This happened night after night, and such behaviour was so strange that Dame Pender, the farmer's wife, decided to see what she could do. But no sooner did she try to milk Rosie than the cow put up her foot, kicked the bucket to bits, and raced away, bellowing, tail on end. During this spring, the farmer's cattle and field thrived wonderfully, and so things continued until May Day. Now on May Day night, when Molly attempted, as usual, to milk Rosie, she was surprised to see the cow stand quietly and to hear her begin to moo gently, and more wonderful still, the pail was soon full of foaming new milk. Molly rose from her stool and, pulling a handful of grass, rolled it into a pad and tucked it in her hat so that she might the more easily carry the bucket on her head. She put the hat on again. When what was her amazement to see whole swarms of little fairies running around Rosie, while others were on her back, neck, and head, and still others were under her, holding up clover blossoms and buttercups in which to catch the streams of milk that flowed from her udder, the little fairies moved around so swiftly that Molly's head grew dizzy as she watched them. Rosie seemed pleased; she tried to lick the little people. They tickled her behind the horns, ran up and down her back. Smoothing each hair or chasing away the flies, and after all the fairies had drunk their fill, they brought armfuls of clover and grass to Rosie, and she ate it all and lowed for more. Molly stood with her bucket on her head, like one spellbound, watching the little people, and she would have continued to stand there, but Dame Pender, the farmer's wife, called her loudly to know why she had not brought the milk if there was any. At the first sound of Dame Pender's voice, all the fairies pointed their fingers at Molly and made such wry faces that she was frightened almost to death. Then whisk, and they were gone. Molly hurried to the house and told her mistress and her master too all that she had seen. Surely, said Dame Pender, you must have a four-leaved clover somewhere about you. Give me the wad of grass in your hat. Molly took it out and gave it to her. And sure enough, there was the four-leaved clover which had opened Molly's eyes on that May Day. As for Rosie, she kicked up her heels and, bellowing like mad, galloped away. Over meadows and moors, she went racing and roaring, and was never seen again. End of chapter forty-four. Recording by phone. Chapter forty-five of the Book of Elves and Fairies. For storytelling and reading aloud, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. The Gilly Do 
from Scotland. Once upon a time a little girl named Jessie was wandering in the wood and lost her way. It was summer time and the air was warm. She wandered on and on, trying to find her way home, but she could not find the path out of the wood. Twilight came, and weary and footsore, she sat down under a fir tree and began to cry. "'Why are you crying, little girl?' said a voice behind her. Jessie looked around and saw a pretty little man dressed in moss and green leaves. His eyes were dark as dark, and his hair was black as black, and his mouth was large and showed a hundred white teeth as small as sea pearls. He was smiling merrily, and his cream-yellow cheeks were dimpled, and his eyes were soft and kindly. Indeed, he seemed so friendly that Jessie quite forgot to be afraid. "'Why are you crying, little girl?' he asked again. "'Your teardrops are falling like dew on the blue flowers at your feet.' "'I've lost my way,' sobbed Jessie, "'and the night is coming on.' "'Do not cry, little girl,' he said gently. "'I will lead you through the wood. I know every path. "'The rabbit's path, the hare's path, the fox's path, the goat's path, "'the path of the deer, and the path of men.' "'Oh, thank you, thank you!' exclaimed Jessie, as she looked the tiny man up and down, and wondered to see his strange clothes. "'Where do you dwell, little girl?' asked he. So Jessie told him, and he said, "'You have been walking every way but the right way. Follow me, and you'll reach home before the stars come out to peep at us through the trees.' Then he turned around and began to trip lightly in front of her, and she followed on. He went so fast that she feared she might lose sight of him, but he turned around again and again and smiled and beckoned. And when he saw that she was still far behind, he danced and twirled about until she came up. Then he scampered on as before. At length Jessie reached the edge of the wood, and, oh joy, there was her father's house beside the blue lake. Then the little man, smiling, bade her good-bye. "'Have I not led you well?' said he. "'Do not forget me. I am the gilly Dew from Fairyland. I love little girls and boys. If you are ever lost in the wood again, I will come and help you.' Goodbye, little girl, goodbye. And laughing merrily, he trotted away and was soon lost to sight among the trees. End of chapter 45. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 46 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. How Kahukura Learned to Make Nets from New Zealand. Once upon a time, there lived a man named Kahukura. One evening, when he was on his way to a distant village, he came to a lonely spot on the seashore. As he was walking slowly along, he saw a large pile of the heads and tails of fishes lying on the beach. Now in those days men had no nets and were obliged to catch fish with spears and hooks, and when Kahukura saw the pile he was very much astonished. "'Who has had such luck?' he exclaimed. "'It is hard to catch one fish. Here must be the heads and tails of a thousand. Then he looked closely at the footprints in the sand. "'No mortals have been fishing here,' he cried. "'Fairies must have done this. I will watch tonight and see what they do.' So when darkness came, he returned to the spot and hid behind the rock. He waited a long time, and at last he saw a fleet of tiny canoes come spinning over the waves. They ranged themselves in a line at a distance from the shore, and Kaukura could see many little figures in them bending and pulling. 
he could even hear small voices shouting the net here the net there then the little figures dropped something overboard and began to haul it toward the shore singing very sweetly the while when the canoes drew near land kaukura saw that each was crowded with fairies they all sprang out upon the beach and began to drag ashore a great net filled with fishes while the fairies were struggling with the net kaukura joined them and hauled away at the rope he was a very fair man so that his skin seemed almost as white as the fairies and they did not notice him so he pulled away and pulled away and soon the net was landed the fairies ran forward to divide the catch it was just at the peep of dawn and they hurried to take all the fish they could carry each fairy stringing his share by running a twig through the gills and as they strung the fish they kept calling out to one another hurry hurry we must finish before the sun rises kahukura had a short string with a knot in the end and he strung his share on it until it was filled but when he lifted the string the knot gave way and all the fish slid to the ground then some of the fairies ran forward to help him and tied the knot again he filled the string and all the fish slid off and again the fairies tied the knot meanwhile day began to break over the sea and the sun to rise then the fairies saw kahukura's face and knew that he was a man they gave little cries of terror they ran this way and that in confusion they left their fish and canoes they abandoned their net and shrieking they all vanished over the sea kahukura seeing that he was alone made haste to examine the canoes they were only the stems of flax he lifted the net it was woven of rushes curiously tied he carried it home and made some like it for his neighbors after that he taught his children how to weave nets and so say the maori folk they all learned to make nets and from that day to this they have caught many fish End of chapter 46 Recording by phone Chapter number 47 Of the Book of Elves and Fairies For Storytelling and Reading Aloud This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott Echo, the Cave Fairy, from the island of Mangaya In the very long ago, Rangi, the Brave, came from the land of the bright parrot feathers to the island of Mangaya swiftly over the blue waves sped his canoe he stepped out upon the land and lay down to rest in the shade of a broad leaf tree covered with gorgeous blooms and after he had slept and was refreshed he arose and wandered about the island beautiful was the place with cocoa palms waving their tall fronds in the air and with banana leaves heavy with golden fruit but though rangi walked all that day and the next he saw no human being he heard no sounds except the beat of the sea against the shore and the whirring of hundreds of bright-winged birds that passed like flashes of blue green and crimson from tree to tree and from grove to grove softly the perfume breezes fanned his cheek and played in his hair like a lovely dream is this island thought he but as lonely as the sea on a moonlit night then to comfort himself he threw back his head and called hello hello and from a pile of rocks overhanging a deep gorge a voice answered hello who art thou cried rangi in wonder what is thy name and the voice answered more softly what is thy name where art thou where art thou hidden he shouted and the voice answered mockingly where art thou hidden then rangi in anger shouted fiercely accursed be thou hide and seek spirit 
and the voice screamed back as if in derision a curse be thou thereupon rangi grasped his spear tighter and strode toward the rocks determined to punish the insolent one leaping from boulder to boulder he entered the gorge and ever as he proceeded he shouted threats and ever the mocking voice answered from some distant spot the gorge grew darker and narrower until rangi suddenly found himself in a wide-mouthed cavern its walls and roof glittered with pendant crystals from which fell drop by drop clear water like dew a white mist rose from the rocky floor and through it rangi saw dimly a lovely fairy face gazing roguishly at him it was wreathed in rippling hair and crowned with flowers archly it smiled then melted away in the mist who art thou whispered rangi in awe art thou echo indeed and from the glittering walls and roof came a thousand sweet answers echo indeed end of chapter 47 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number 48 of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott the isles of the sea fairies among the isles of the golden mist i lived for many a year and all that chanced unto me there tis well that ye should hear i dwelt in a hall of silvery pearl with rainbow light inlaid i sate on a throne old as the sea of the ruby coral made they made me king of the fairy isles that lie in the golden mist where the coral rocks and the silvery sand by singing waves are kissed far off in the ocean solitudes they lie a glorious seven like a beautiful group of sister stars in the untraced heights of heaven o beautiful isles where the coral rocks like an ancient temple stand like a temple of wondrous workmanship for a lofty worship planned o beautiful isles and a fairy race as the dream of a poet fair now hold the place by a charmed spell with power o'er sea and air their boats are made of the large pearl shell that the waters cast to land with carved prows more richly wrought than works of the mortal hand they skim along the silver waves without or sail or oar whenever the fairy voyager would the pearl ship comes to shore i love that idle life for a time but when that time was by I pined again for another change, for the love in a human eye. They brought me then a glorious form, and gave her form my bride. I looked on her and straight forgot that I was to earth allied. For many a year and more I dwelt in those isles of soft delight, where all was kind and beautiful, with neither death nor night. We danced on the sands when the silver moon through the coral arches gleamed, and pathways broad of glittering light o'er the azure waters streamed. Then shot forth many a pearly boat like stars across the sea, and songs were sung and shells were blown that set wild music free. For many a year and more I dwelt 
with neither thought nor care till i forgot almost my speech forgot both creed and prayer at length it chanced that as my boat went on its charmed way i came unto the veil of mist which round the seven isles lay even then it was a sabbath morn a ship was passing by and i heard a hundred voices raise a sound of palm ode a mighty love came o'er my heart a yearning toward my kind and unwittingly i spoke aloud the impulse of my mind o oh, take me hence ye christian men i cried in spiritual want anon the golden mist gave way that had been like adamant the little boat wherein i stayed seemed all to melt away and i was left upon the sea like peter in dismay those christian mariners amazed looked on me in affright some cried i was an evil ghost and some a water sprite but the chaplain seized the vessel's boat with mercy prompt and boon and took me up into the ship as i fell into a swoon in vain i told of what had happened no man to me would list they jested at the fairy isles and at the golden mist they swore i was a shipwrecked man tossed on the dreary main and pitied me because they thought my woes had crazed my brain and soon a wondrous thing i saw i now was old and gray a man of threescore years and ten a weak man in decay and yesterday and i was young time did not leave a trace upon my form whilst i abode within the charmed place mary howlett condensed End of chapter forty eight recording by linda Marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty nine of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annalisa botker the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott chapter forty nine away away to fairyland but we that live in fairyland no sickness know nor pain i quit my body when i will and take to it again our shapes and size we can convert to either large or small an old nutshell's the same to us as is the lofty hall we sleep in rosebuds soft and sweet we revel in the stream we wanton lightly on the wind or glide on a sunbeam old ballad end of chapter forty nine away away to fairyland recording by annalisa bodker chapter fifty of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott the magic ferns from cornwall not many years since there lived in cornwall a pretty young girl named cherry as she and her mother were poor 
Cherry determined to go out to service. So one morning early, she took her little bundle of clothes and started out to find a place with some respectable family. She walked until she came to four crossroads, and not knowing which to follow, she sat down on a boulder to think. The spot where she sat was covered with beautiful ferns that curled their delicate fronds over the boulder, and while she was lost in thought, she unconsciously picked a few fronds and crushed them in her hand. Immediately she heard a strange voice at her elbow say, My pretty young woman, what are you looking for? She glanced up and saw standing near her a handsome young man who was holding a bunch of the ferns. I'm looking for a place, sir, she said. And what kind of place do you wish? asked he, with a sweet and winning smile. I am not particular, answered she. I can make myself generally useful. Indeed, said the stranger, and do you think you could look after one little boy? That I'd love to do, said she, smiling. Then, replied he, I wish to hire you for a year and a day. My home is not far from here. Will you go with me, Cherry, and see it? Cherry stared in astonishment to hear him speak her name, and he added, Oh, I see you thought that I did not know you. I watched you one day while you were dressing your hair beside one of my ponds, and I saw you pluck some of my sweetest scented violets to put in those lovely tresses. But will you go with me, Cherry? For a year and a day? asked she. You need not be alarmed, he said he very kindly. Just kiss the fern leaf that is in your hand and say, For a year and a day I promise to stay. Is that all? said Cherry. So she kissed the fern leaf and said the words as he told her to. Instantly the young man passed the bunch of ferns that he held over both her eyes. The ground in front of her seemed to open, and though she did not feel herself move from the boulder where she sat, yet she knew that she was going down rapidly into the earth. Here we are, Cherry, said the young man. Is there a tear of sorrow under your eyelid? If so, let me wipe it away, for no human tear can enter our dwelling. And as he spoke, he brushed Cherry's eyes with the fern leaves, and lo, before her was such a country as she had never dreamed of. Hills and valleys were covered with flowers strangely brilliant, so that the whole country appeared to be sown with gems that glittered in light as clear as that of the summer sun, yet as mild as moonshine. There were glimmering rivers and singing waterfalls and sparkling fountains, while everywhere beautiful little ladies and gentlemen dressed in green and gold were walking or sitting on banks of flowers. Oh, it was a wonderful world. Here we are at home, said the young man, and strangely enough he was changed. He had become the handsomest little man Cherry had ever seen and he wore a green silk coat covered with spangles of gold. He led her into a noble mansion, the furniture of which was of ivory and pearl, inlaid with gold and silver, and studded with emeralds. After passing through many rooms, they came to one whose walls were hung with lace, as fine as the finest cobwebs, and most beautifully twined with flowers. In the middle of the room was a cradle of wrought seashell, reflecting so many colors that Cherry could scarcely bear to look at it. The little man led her to this, and in it was lying asleep a little boy so beautiful that he ravished the sight. This is your charge, said the little man. I am king of this country, and I wish my son to know something of human nature. 
you have nothing to do but to wash and dress the boy when he wakes to take him walking in the garden to tell him stories and to put him to sleep when he is weary cherry was delighted beyond words for at first sight she loved the darling little boy and when he woke he seemed to love her just as dearly she was very happy and cared tenderly for him and the time passed with astonishing rapidity in fact it seemed scarcely a week later when she opened her eyes and found everything about her changed indeed there she was lying in her own bed in her mother's cottage she heard her mother calling her name with joy and the neighbors came crowding around her bed it was just one year and a day from the time when she had sat on the boulder and had met the fine young man she told her adventures to all but they would not believe her they shook their heads and went away saying poor cherry is certainly mad from that day on she was never happy but sat pining and dreaming of the hour when she had picked the magic ferns and though she often went back to the boulder she never again saw the young man nor found the way to fairyland end of chapter fifty recording by linda Marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter fifty one of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott chapter fifty one the smith and the fairies from scotland Years ago there lived in Scotland an honest, hard-working smith. He had only one child, a boy, fourteen years of age, cheerful, strong, and healthy. Suddenly the boy fell ill. He took to his bed and moped away whole days. No one could tell what was the matter with him. Although he had a tremendous appetite, he wasted away, getting thin, yellow, and old. At last one morning... While the smith was standing idly at his forge with no heart for work, he was surprised to see a wise man, who lived at some distance, enter his shop. The smith hastened to tell him about his son, and to ask his advice. The wise man listened gravely, then said, The boy has been carried away by the little people, and they have left a changeling in his place. Alas, and what am I to do? asked the smith. How am I ever to see my own son again? "'I will tell you how,' answered the wise man. "'But first, to make sure that it is not your own son you have, "'gather together all the eggshells you can get. "'Go into the room where the boy is, "'and spread them out carefully before him. "'Then pour water in them, "'and carry them carefully in your hands, two by two. "'Carry them as though they were very heavy, "'and arrange them around the fireplace.' "'The smith, accordingly, "'collected as many eggshells as he could find.' He went into the room and did as the wise man had said. He had not been long at work, before there came from the bed where the boy lay a great shout of laughter, and the boy cried out, "'I am now eight hundred years old, and I have never seen the like of that before!' The smith hurried back and told this to the wise man. "'Did I not assure you,' said the wise man, "'that it is not your son whom you have. "'Your son is in a fairy mound not far from here.' "'Get rid as soon as possible of this changeling, "'and I think I may promise you your son again. "'You must light a very great and bright fire "'before the bed on which this stranger is lying. "'He will ask you why you are doing so. "'Answer him at once. "'You shall see presently when I lay you upon it. "'If you do this, the changeling will become frightened "'and fly through the roof.' "'The smith again followed the wise man's advice, "'kindled a blazing fire and answered as he had been told to do.' and just as he was going to seize the changeling and fling him on the fire, the thing gave an awful yell and sprang through the roof. The smith, overjoyed, returned to the wise man and told him this. On midsummer night, said the wise man, 
the fairy mound where your boy is kept will open. You must provide yourself with a dirk and a crowing cock. Go to the mound. You will hear singing and dancing and much merriment going on. At twelve o'clock a door in the mound will open. Advance boldly. Enter this door, but first stick the dirk in the ground before it, to prevent the mound from closing. You will find yourself in a spacious apartment, beautifully clean, and there, working at a forge, you will see your son. The fairies will then question you, and you must answer that you have come for your son, and will not go without him. Do this, and see what happens. Midsummer night came, and the smith provided himself with a dirk and a crowing cock. He went to the fairy mound, and all happened as the wise man had said. The fairies came crowding around him, buzzing and pinching his legs, and when he had said that he had come for his son and would not go away without him, they all gave a loud laugh. At the same minute, the cock that was dozing in the smith's arms woke up. It leaped to his shoulder, and clapping its wings, crowed loud and long. At that the fairies were furious. They seized the smith and his son, and threw them out of the mound, and pulled up the dirk and flung it after them. And in an instant all was dark. For a year and a day the boy never spoke, nor would he do a turn of work. At last, one morning, as he was watching his father finish a sword, he exclaimed, "'That's not the way to do it!' And taking the tools from his father's hands, he set to work, and soon fashioned a glittering sharp sword, the like of which had never been seen before. From that day on, the boy helped his father, and showed him how to make fairy swords, and in a few years they both became rich and famous, and they always lived together contentedly and happily. End of chapter 51、chapter、number、of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. The Coal Black Steed from England. Late one night, a bright, quiet, moonlight night, old Dame Moll lay snugly sleeping in her bed when suddenly she was wakened by a noise like a rushing. Storm. The next minute there came a loud rap, rap, rap at her cottage door. Startled and frightened, she sprang out of bed and opened the door on a crack. Don't be afraid, good woman, said a squeaky voice. Open wide, open wide. So she opened a bit wider and saw a strange, squint eyed, ugly little fellow standing on the door stone. Somehow the look in his eyes seemed to cast a spell over her and made her, willy nilly, open the door very wide. My wife has sent for you, good woman, said he. You must come with me and bathe and dress our newborn child. Your wife? thought the poor dame. Heaven defend me. Sure as I live, I am going to care for a little imp. But she could not refuse to go, for the spell in the little man's eyes drew her, and she was forced to walk toward a coal black steed that stood snorting before the door. Its eyes were red hot balls, and its breath was like smoke. And how Dame Moll got to the place she never could tell, but suddenly she found herself set down by a neat but poor cottage. And saw two tidy children playing before the door. In a minute she was seated in front of a roaring hearth fire, washing and dressing a small baby. But a very active and naughty baby it was, though only an hour old, for it lifted its fist and gave the good dame such a rousing box on her ear that it made her head ring. Anoint its eyes with this salve, my good woman, said the mother, who was lying in a neat white bed. So Dame Moll took the box of salve, 
and rubbed a bit on the child's eyes. Why not a drop on mine, thought she, since it must be elfin ointment. So she rubbed her finger over her right eye. O oh, ye powers of fairyland, what did she see? The neat but homely cottage had become a great and beautiful room. The mother, dressed in white silk, lay in an ivory bed. The babe was robed in silvery gauze. The two older children, who had just come into the cottage, were seated one on either side of the mother's pillow. But they, too, were changed, for now they were little flat-nosed imps who, with mops and mows, and with many a grin and grimace, were pulling the mother's ears with their long, hairy paws. When Dame Mole saw this, she knew that she was in a place of enchantment, and without saying a word about having anointed her own eye, she made haste to finish drowsing the elfin babe. Then the squint-eyed little old fellow once more placed her behind him on the cold black steed, and away they went sailing through the air, and he set her down safely before her door. On the next market day, when Dame Mole was selling eggs, what did she see but the little old fellow himself, busied, like a rogue, stealing some things from the market stalls? Oh, ho! cried she. I've caught you, you thief! What? exclaimed he. Do you see me today? See you? To be sure I do, as plain as the sun in the sky and I see you very busy stealing, in the bargain. With which eye do you see me? said he. With my right eye, to be sure, answered Dame Mole. The ointment, the ointment, exclaimed the little man. Take that for meddling with what did not belong to you. And he struck her in the eye as he spoke. And from that day to this, old Dame Mole has been blind in the right eye and surely it served her right for stealing the fairy ointment. End of chapter 52 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 53 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott The Girl Who Was Stolen by the Fairies From Ireland Never go near an elfin mound on May Day, for in the month of May the fairies are very powerful, and they wander about the meadows looking for pretty maidens to carry off to fairyland. One beautiful May Day in old Ireland, a young girl fell asleep at noonday on an elfin mound. The fairies saw how pretty she was, so they carried her off to fairyland and left her instead an image that looked exactly like her. Evening fell, and as the girl did not return home, her mother sent the neighbors to look for her in all directions. They found the image, and, thinking that it was the girl herself, they carried it home, and laid it in her bed. But the image never moved nor spoke, and lay there silently for two days. On the morning of the third day, an old witch-woman entered the house, and looking at the image said, Your daughter is fairy struck. Rub this ointment on her forehead and see what you shall see. Then the old woman placed a vial of green ointment in the mother's hand and disappeared. The mother immediately rubbed the forehead of the image, and the girl herself sat up in bed weeping and wringing her hands. Oh, mother, she cried, 
oh why did you bring me back i was so happy i was in a beautiful palace where handsome princesses and princes were dancing to the sweetest music they made me dance with them and threw a mantle of rich gold over my shoulders now it is all gone and i shall never see the beautiful palace any more then the mother wept and said oh my child stay with me i have no other daughter but you and if the fairies take you i shall die the girl wept loudly at this and throwing her arms around her mother's neck kissed her and promised that she would not go near the elfin mound and she kept her word so she never saw the fairies again end of chapter 53 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter number 54 of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Frances Jenkins Olcott The Girl Who Danced with the Fairies from Ireland One must never wander about alone on Halloween, for then the fairies are a broad looking for mortals to trick and lead astray now there was once a girl the prettiest girl in all ireland who late one halloween was going to a spring to fetch some water her foot slipped and she fell when she got up she looked about her and saw that she was in a very strange place a great fire was burning near around which a number of people beautifully dressed were dancing a handsome young man like a prince with a red sash and a golden band in his hair left the fire and came toward her he greeted her kindly and asked her to dance it is a foolish thing sir to ask me to dance replied she since there is no music at that the young man lifted his hand and instantly the most delicious music sounded then he took her by the fingers and drew her into the dance around and around they whirled and they danced and danced until the moon and stars went down and all the time the girl seemed to float in the air and she forgot everything except the sweet music and the young man at last the dancing ceased and a door opened in the earth the young man who seemed to be the king of all led the girl down a pair of stairs followed by all the gay company at the end of a long passage they came to a hall bright and beautiful with gold and silver and lights a table was covered with everything good to eat and wine was poured out in golden cups the young man lifted a cup and offered it to the girl at the same moment someone whispered in her ear do not drink do not eat if you do either you will never see your home again well the girl when she heard that set the cup down and refused to drink immediately all the company grew angry a great buzzing arose the lights went out and the girl felt something grasp her and rush her forth from the hall and up the stairs and in a minute she found herself beside the spring holding her pitcher in her hand she did not wait for anything but ran home as fast as she could and locked herself in tight and crept into bed then she heard a great clamor of little voices outside her door and she could hear them cry the power we had over you tonight is gone because you refused to drink but wait until next halloween night 
when you dance with us on the hill then we shall keep you forever forever end of chapter 54 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter number 55 of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott elidor and the golden ball from wales once upon a time in the land of wales near the fall of the ta into the sea there lived a boy called elidor he was a bright lad but so fond of play that he would not study at all his teacher flogged him so often and so hard that one morning Elidor ran away from home, and hid under a hollow bank by the side of the river. There he stayed two nights and two days, getting hungrier and thirstier every moment. At last, when it seemed as if he could stand his sufferings no longer, he saw a little door open in the side of the bank, and two elfin men step out. They stood before him, and bowing low, said, Come with us, dear boy, and we will lead you to a land full of delights and sports, where you may play all the time. Elidor was overjoyed. He rose and followed the elfin men through the door. They conducted him down a long, dark passage through the hill. At length they came out into a beautiful country, adorned with singing crystal streams and flowery meadows. But it was always twilight there, for the light of the sun, moon, and stars could not reach that land. The elfin men led Elidor to a golden palace and presented him to the king of the elves, who was seated upon his throne and was surrounded by a train of little people richly clad. The king questioned Elidor kindly, then, calling his eldest son, the elfin prince, bade him take the earth boy and make him happy. So Elidor dwelt in elfin land, and day after day was fed with milk and saffron, and he played with the elfin prince, tossing gold and silver balls. When he walked in the meadows to pick flowers, he saw everywhere about him the elfin people, with long flowing yellow hair, riding on little horses and chasing tiny deer with fairy hounds. For all the people in elfin land played and rode about night and day, and they never worked. Sometimes on moonlit nights they rode through the dark passage to the upper world and danced in fairy rings on the grass. And when they went to their dances, they took Elidor with them. After Elidor had lived in Elfin Land for some time, the king permitted him one moonlit night to go alone through the dark passage to visit his mother. He did so, and she was delighted to see him, for she had thought him dead. He told her about the wonders of Elfin Land and how he was fed on milk and saffron, and played with gold and silver toys. She begged him, the next time he came, to bring her a bit of fairy gold. He promised to do so, and returned to Elfinland. It so happened, one day soon after this, that Alidor was playing with the elfin prince. He snatched a beautiful golden ball from the prince's hands, and hastened with it through the dark passage. As he ran, he heard behind him the shouts of many angry elves, and the sound of their horses' hoofs, and the barking of the fairy dogs, 
and knew he was being pursued faster he ran in terror but nearer came the patter of a thousand little feet and the elfin shouts still more terrified he rushed through the door in the hill and sped homeward as he sprang into his mother's house his foot caught and he fell over the threshold at the same moment two elves who had outrun the others leaped over him and snatched the golden ball from his hands thief robber thief they screamed and vanished as for elidor he rose up too ashamed to eat or sleep that night the next day he went to the river bank and searched for the door but he could find no trace of it and though he searched every day for a year he never again found the entrance to elfinland but from that time he was a changed boy he studied hard loved truth and hated lying and stealing and when he grew up he became a great man in wales end of chapter fifty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter fifty six of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Alcott At the Court of Fairyland 1. Queen Mab This is Mab, the mistress fairy, that doth nightly rob the dairy, and can hurt or help the churning, as she please without discerning she that pinches country wenches if they rub not clean their benches and with sharper nails remembers when they rake not up their embers but if so they chance to feast her in a shoe she drops a tester ben johnson two queen mab's chariot her chariot ready straight is made each thing therein is fitting laid that she by nothing might be stayed for naught must be her letting for nimble gnats the horses were their harnesses of gossamer fly cranian her charioteer upon the coach-box getting her chariot of a snail's fine shell which for the colours did excel the fair queen mab becoming well so lively was the limning the seat the soft wool of the bee the cover gallantly to see the wing of a pied butterflea i trow to a simple trimming the wheels composed of cricket's bones and daintily made for the nonce for fear of rattling on the stones with thistle-down they shot it for all her maidens much did fear if oberon had chanced to hear that mab his queen should have been there he would not have obeyed it she mounts her chariot with a trice nor would she stay for no advice until her mates that were so nice to wait on her were fitted but ran herself away alone which when they heard there was not one but hasted after to be gone as she had been diswitted michael drayton three mab's elfin maids of honor hop and mop and drop so clear pip and trip and skip that were to mab their sovereign ever dear her special maids of honor fib and tib and pink and pin tick and quick and jill and gin tit and knit and wap and win the train that weighed upon her upon a grasshopper they got and what with amble and with trot for hedge nor ditch they spared not but after her they hide them a cobweb over them they throw to shield the wind if it should blow themselves they wisely could bestow lest any should espy them michael drayton four king oberon's palace 
this palace standeth in the air by necromancy placed there that it no tempests needs to fear which way soever it blow it and somewhat southward toward the noon whence lies away up to the moon and thence the fairy can as soon pass to earth below it the walls of spider legs are made well mortised and finely laid he was the master of his trade it curiously that builded the windows of the eyes of cats and for the roof instead of slats is covered with the skins of bats with moonshine that are gilded michael drayton five the fairy's umbrella i spied king oberon and his beauteous queen attended by a nimble-footed train of fairies tripping o'er the meadows green and to me words methought they came amain i couched myself behind a bush to spy what would betide the noble company it gan to rain the king and queen they run under a mushroom fretted overhead with glow-worms artificially done resembling much the canopy of a bed of cloth of silver and such glimmering light it gave as stars do in a frosty night old poem six a fairy's armor he put his acorn helmet on it was plumed of the silk of the thistle-down the corslet plate that guarded his breast was once the wild bee's golden vest his cloak of a thousand mingled dyes was formed of the wings of butterflies his shield was the shell of a ladybug queen studs of gold on a ground of green and the quivering lance which he brandished bright was the sting of a wasp he had slain in fight swift he bestrode his firefly steed he bared his blade of the bent grass blue he drove his spurs of the cockle seed and away like a glance of thought he flew to skim the heavens and follow far the fiery trail of the rocket star joseph rodman drake seven fairy revels come follow follow me you fairy elves that be which circle on the green come follow mab your queen hand in hand let's dance around for this place is fairy ground when mortals are at rest and snoring in their nest unheard and unespied through keyholes we do glide over tables stools and shelves we trip it with our fairy elves and if the house be foul with platter dish or bowl upstairs we nimbly creep and find the maids asleep there we pinch their arms and thighs none escapes nor none espies but if the house be swept and from uncleanness kept we praise the household maid and duly she is paid for we use before we go to drop a tester in her shoe upon a mushroom's head our tablecloth we spread a grain of rye or wheat is manchet which we eat pearly drops of dew we drink in acorn cups filled to the brink the brains of nightingales with unctuous fat of snails between two cockles stewed is meat that's easily chewed tails of worms and marrow of mice do make a dish that's wondrous nice the grasshopper gnat and fly serve for our minstrelsy grace said we dance a while and so the time beguile and if the moon doth hide her head the glow-worm lights us home to bed on tops of dewy grass so nimbly do we pass the young and tender stalk ne'er bends when we do walk yet in the morning may be seen where we the night before have been old ballad eight fairy songs where the bee sucks there suck i in a cowslip's bell i lie there i couch when owls do cry on the bat's back i do fly after summer merrily 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 shall i live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough shakespeare from oberon in fairyland the king of ghosts and shadows there mad robin i at his command 
am sent to view the night sports here what revel rout is kept about in every corner where i go i will o'er see and merry be and make good sport with ho 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 more swift than lightning can i fly about this airy welkin soon and in a minute's space descry each thing that's done below the moon there's not a hag or ghost shall wag or cry where goblins where i go but robin i their feats will spy and send them home with ho 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 by wells and rills in meadows green we nightly dance our heyday guise and to our fairy king and queen we chant our moonlight minstrelsies when larks gin sing away we fling and babes new-born steal as we go and elf in bed we leave instead and wend us laughing ho 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 old ballad condensed end of at the court of fairyland chapter fifty seven of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tracy butterick the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins alcott part two fairy stories chapter fifty seven fairy godmothers and wonderful gifts rap 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 who's turling at the pin i'm your fairy godmother will you let me in pointed red cap long peaked chin twinkling black eyes why should i let you in rap 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 open wide your door i'm your fairy godmother with gifts three score end of chapter fifty seven Chapter Fifty Eight of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Lilliard. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Cinderella, or the Little Glass Slipper once upon a time there was a gentleman who married for his second wife a woman who was the haughtiest and proudest ever seen she had two daughters who resembled her in temper the husband however had a young daughter by his first wife who was of a sweetness and goodness without limit she was like her own mother who had been the most sweet-tempered woman in the world the wedding was no sooner over than the stepmother began to show her bad disposition. She could not endure the young girl, whose sweetness made her own daughter seem more detestable. She forced her to do the hardest work in the house. It was she who washed the dishes and put them in their places. It was she who polished the bedroom floors for her stepmother and two sisters. She slept under the eaves in a garret on a wretched mattress, while her sisters lay in elegant rooms where the beds were soft and white and the walls were lined with long mirrors in which the sisters could see themselves from head to foot the poor girl suffered all this with patience and she did not dare complain to her father for he would have scolded her as he was completely governed by his wife each day after the girl had finished her work she sat down in the chimney corner among the cinders so they called her cinderella nevertheless cinderella in spite of her shabby clothes was more polite and a hundred times more beautiful than her sisters although they were magnificently dressed it happened one day that the king's son gave a ball and that he invited everybody of rank the ugly sisters were also invited, because they always made a grand figure at all court festivities. They were very glad at the thought of attending the royal ball, and busied themselves in choosing the robes and headdresses which should be most becoming. But, alas, 
it was more trouble and work for cinderella for it was she who did her sisters ironing and fluted their ruffles night and morning they talked only of their clothes i said the eldest shall wear my red velvet robe with rich lace trimming i said the younger shall have only my plain skirt but to make up for its plainness i shall put on my cloak flowered with gold and my tiara of diamonds they called in cinderella to ask her advice for she had excellent taste cinderella gave them the best counsel in the world and even offered to do their hair for which they were very glad and while she was arranging their locks in two rows of puffs they asked cinderella would you not be delighted to go to the ball alas you are mocking me replied she it would be no place for me you are right answered the sisters laughing scornfully everybody would laugh well to see such a scrub girl as you at the ball any one but cinderella would have done their hair crooked out of rage but she was so sweet that she did her very best they went two days without eating so excited were they with joy they broke a dozen lacings trying to make their waists smaller and they spent all their time before the mirrors at last the happy day arrived and as they departed for the ball cinderella followed them with her eyes as long as she could then she burst into tears her godmother who saw her in tears asked what was the matter i wish i wish and cinderella sobbed so that she could not finish her godmother who was a fairy said you wish to go to the ball don't you alas yes sighed cinderella then be a good girl said her godmother and you shall go now run into the garden and bring me a pumpkin cinderella went and picked the biggest she could find and as she carried it to her godmother she wondered how that pumpkin could help her go to the ball her godmother scooped out all the inside leaving only the rind which she struck with her wand instantly it became a golden coach then she went to look at the mouse trap in which she found six mice she bade cinderella open the trap and as each mouse sprang out she touched it with her wand and instantly it was changed into a handsome horse as the godmother was wondering out of what to make a coachman cinderella said i will go and see if there is a rat in the trap then we can make a coachman that is a good thought said her godmother go and see cinderella brought the trap in which there were three large rats her godmother chose one of the three because of his long whiskers and when she touched him he was instantly changed into a big coachman who had the handsomest mustaches ever seen then she said to cinderella go into the garden you will find there six lizards behind the watering pot bring them to me cinderella had no sooner brought them than they were changed into six footmen in gold-laced coats who sprang up behind the coach with the air of never having done anything else in their lives then the fairy said to cinderella here is a fine coach in which to go to the ball are you not glad yes replied she but must i go in these ugly clothes her godmother in answer touched her with her wand and instantly her old clothes were changed into robes of gold and silver embroidered with gems then her godmother presented her with a pair of glass slippers the prettiest in the world now that cinderella was all dressed she got into the coach but her godmother told her above all things not to remain a minute later than midnight for if she remained a single minute longer her coach would become a pumpkin her horses mice her coachman a rat and her footmen lizards while all her fine clothes would change to rags cinderella promised her godmother that she would not fail to return before midnight she departed for the ball 
so joyful that she did not know herself the king's son who was informed by his servants of the arrival of a beautiful princess whom nobody knew ran to receive her he assisted her to descend from the coach and led her into the hall where the guests were assembled there was a great silence people stopped dancing and the violins ceased playing while all crowded around to see the beauty of the unknown one then a confused murmur arose oh how beautiful she is the king even old as he was could not take his eyes off her and he whispered to the queen that it was long since he had seen such a handsome and amiable person all the ladies were anxious to examine her headdress and robes and they decided to have some made like them the very next morning provided of course that they could procure beautiful enough materials and needlewomen sufficiently skilful the king's son led cinderella to the place of honor and asked her to dance with him she danced with such grace that she was more admired than ever a superb banquet was served but the young prince did not taste it so much was he occupied in gazing at her she seated herself by her sisters and showed them a thousand attentions she offered them a share of the oranges and lemons that the prince had given her which greatly surprised them for they did not know her while they were chatting cinderella heard the clock strike a quarter before twelve she immediately bowed to the company and hastened away as fast as she could when she arrived at home she found her fairy godmother and having thanked her told her how she longed to go again the next night for the prince had invited her and while she was relating all the things that had happened at the ball she heard the two sisters rap at the door cinderella opened it how late you are she said if you had been at the ball replied one of the sisters you would not think it late there came the most beautiful princess you have ever dreamed of she was devoted to us and gave us oranges and lemons cinderella could scarcely contain herself for joy she asked the name of the princess we do not know they said even the king's son is curious to learn who she is cinderella smiled and said to the elder sister was she so beautiful then how happy you are the next night the sisters went to the ball cinderella went too even more magnificently attired than the first time the king's son was constantly by her side and never ceased whispering sweet things cinderella was not at all weary and she forgot what her godmother had told her so that when she heard the first stroke of midnight she could not believe that it was more than eleven o'clock she sprang up and fled as swiftly as a deer the prince followed her but could not catch her she lost one of her glass slippers which he tenderly picked up cinderella reached home breathless without coach or footman and clad in rags nothing remained of all her splendor but one little glass slipper for she had dropped the other the prince's attendants asked the palace guard if they had seen a princess pass by they said that they had seen no one except a poorly dressed girl who looked more like a peasant than a princess when her sisters returned cinderella asked if they had had a good time again and if the lovely princess had been present they said yes but that she had fled as soon as twelve o'clock had sounded and that she had dropped one of her little glass slippers it was the prettiest thing and that the prince had picked it up and that he had done nothing but look at it for the rest of the night assuredly he must be very much in love with the princess to whom it belonged and they were right a few days after this the king's son sent a herald who announced by sound of a trumpet that the prince would marry any lady whom the glass slipper fitted then commenced a great trying on by princesses and duchesses and all the ladies of the court but it was of no use 
At last they brought the glass slipper to the two sisters, who did their best to get their feet into it, but they could not do so. Cinderella, who was looking on and recognized her slipper, said smilingly, Let me see if it will fit me. Her sisters began to laugh scornfully and to ridicule her, but the attendant who held the slipper, looking attentively at Cinderella, saw that she was very beautiful, and said that she had a right to do so, for he had been ordered to try the slipper on every girl in the kingdom. He made Cinderella seat herself, and placing the slipper on her little foot, saw that it went on easily and fitted her like wax. The amazement of her sisters was great, but was greater still when Cinderella drew the other slipper from her pocket and put it on her other foot. Immediately the fairy godmother arrived, and having touched Cinderella's clothes with her wand, changed them into garments more magnificent than those she had worn before. Then the two sisters recognized her for the beautiful princess whom they had seen at the ball. They threw themselves at her feet and begged forgiveness for the cruel treatment she had suffered. Cinderella raised and embraced them, and assured them that she pardoned them with all her heart, and that she now entreated them to love her dearly. She was then conducted to the palace of the prince, adorned as she was in all her magnificence. The prince found her more beautiful than ever, and a few days after he married her with great pomp. Cinderella, who was as good as she was beautiful, lodged her sisters in the palace and married them on the same day to two great lords of the court. End of Cinderella Chapter 59 of The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Lilliard. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Frances Jenkins Olcott. The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. Once upon a time there lived a king and queen who were most miserable, because they had no children, but when a lovely baby girl was born to them, they were two of the happiest people in the world. And in order to make all things as propitious as possible for the little princess, they invited seven fairies who lived in the kingdom to be her godmothers. When the christening ceremony was over, there was a magnificent banquet given for the fairies. Before each of them was laid a plate of massive gold, and a case, also of massive gold, containing a spoon, a fork, and a knife, all of the same precious metal, and richly studded with diamonds and rubies. But just as everybody was seated at the table, who should enter but an old fairy, who had not been invited because for more than fifty years she had been shut up in a tower, and was supposed to be either dead or enchanted? The king immediately commanded that a chair should be placed for her at the table, but he could not offer her a golden plate and case, for only seven had been made for the seven fairies. The unreasonable old creature considered herself insulted, and began to mutter frightful threats between her teeth. The youngest of the fairies, hearing this, concealed herself behind the tapestry, in order to be the last to speak and so perhaps prevent any harm being done to the little princess. Meanwhile the godmothers began to bestow their gifts. One said, My godchild shall be the most beautiful girl in the whole world. The second added, And she shall have the disposition of an angel. The third said, I give her the gift of perfect grace and graciousness. The fourth added, And she shall dance like a sylph. The fifth said, She shall sing like a nightingale. The sixth added, She shall excel in playing on every sort of musical instrument. Then came the turn of the old fairy, who screamed like a cockatoo, while her head shook more from rage than from age. 
The princess shall pierce her hand with a spindle, and shall die. These dreadful words made the whole company, every one, shudder, and there was no one there who was not drowned in tears. At that moment the youngest fairy appeared from behind the tapestry, and said sweetly, Do not weep, your majesties, your daughter will not die. It is true that I have not power enough to entirely undo the evil that my elder sister has done. The princess will hurt her hand with a spindle, but, instead of dying, she will fall asleep for a hundred years, and then a royal prince will come and waken her. The king, hoping to prevent this calamity, forbade any person in the kingdom either to spin or even to keep a spindle in the house. Any one who disobeyed was to be punished with death. Sixteen years after this, the king and queen went with their court to a castle in the country, when it happened that the young princess, wandering curiously from room to room, mounted to the top of a tower. There she found an old woman sitting alone before her wheel. This old woman had never heard that the king had forbidden any one to spin. "'What are you doing, my good mother?' asked the princess." "'I am spinning, my beautiful child,' answered the old woman. "'Oh, how pretty it is!' exclaimed the princess. "'How do you do it? Give me that so I may see if I can do it as well.' And as she spoke, she took the spindle so eagerly and so quickly that it pierced her hand, and she sank fainting to the floor. The poor old woman, in the greatest distress, cried for help. People came hurrying from all sides. They dashed water on the princess. They unlaced her robes. They bathed her temples with perfumes. But she did not move. Then the king, who, hearing the commotion, was come into the tower room, remembered the malediction of the old fairy. He perceived that the misfortune was a thing that had to come about, since the fairies had foretold it. He caused the princess to be carried to the most splendid apartment in the castle, and to be laid on a couch of down and on pillows of down embroidered with gold and silver. Her eyes were closed, but her soft breathing showed that she was not dead. Then, too, her cheeks were flushed a delicate rose color, and her lips were like coral. She seemed a sleeping angel, she was so beautiful, the kind fairy who had saved the princess's life, was in the kingdom of Mataquin, twelve thousand miles away, but the king instantly sent word of the misfortune by a little dwarf who travelled in seven-league boots, which are boots that pass over seven leagues at each step, and she arrived directly at the castle in a chariot of fire drawn by dragons. She approved of all that the king had done, but being exceedingly wise, she knew that the poor princess would be in a pitiable condition when at the end of a hundred years she awoke to find herself alone in that old castle. She knew of but one thing to do, and she did it. At a wave of her wand, everyone fell asleep. Ladies of honor, waiting maids, squires, pages, stewards, cooks, scullions, porters, footmen, every breathing thing even the horses in the stables with the grooms, the mastiffs in the courtyard, and little Poofy, the princess's lapdog, who was nestling beside her on the couch, all slept. The spits full of partridges over the fire, and even the fire itself, waited silently to serve their mistress when she should wake and need them. Only the king and queen were left to kiss their darling child and go away from the castle. The king forbade any one to approach the place, but this command was not necessary, for within a quarter of an hour there was grown up around the castle park such a vast wood, whose trees, great and small, were so interlaced with briars and thorns that neither man nor beast could pass through. It was plain that the fairy had arranged matters after fairy fashion, taking care that the young princess should not be disturbed while she slept. When the hundred years were gone, a king, not of the family of the princess, reigned over the land. One day his son was hunting near the fairy wood, and asked what were those turrets he saw rising above the trees. People told him everything that they had heard. One said that it was an enchanted castle. 
another said that all the witches in the country held their revels there the most common belief however seemed to be that it was the dwelling place of an ogre who carried off all the children he could catch and devoured them at his leisure for no one could follow him as only he could pass through the wood while the prince was lost in wonder at these tales an old peasant approached him and said your highness more than fifty years ago i heard my father say that in yonder castle was the most beautiful princess on earth and that she would sleep a hundred years and then be wakened by the son of a king and that she would marry him that was enough to set the prince on fire for the adventure in fact he felt in his heart that he was the chosen one he did not delay for an instant no sooner had he taken a step toward the wood than the trees great and small and the thorns and briars disentangled themselves and opened a path he walked toward the castle which stood at the end of a broad avenue he saw with surprise that none of his attendants had been able to follow him for the wood had closed again behind him but all the same he went on boldly he entered a spacious outer court where a person less brave than he would have been paralyzed by fear a death-like silence reigned and many dead men lay stretched upon the ground but the prince saw at second glance that the men had only the appearance of being dead that indeed they were really men-at-arms who had fallen asleep with their half-emptied wine-glasses beside them he ascended the stairway he entered an antechamber where the guard ranged in line with their muskets on their shoulders were snoring contentedly he crossed a presence chamber where many lords and ladies were sleeping some standing and some sitting then he found himself in a magnificent apartment where on a couch whose curtains were lifted slept a young princess as lovely as if she had strayed from paradise the prince knelt beside her and pressed his lips on her white hand that lay on the coverlet the spell was broken the princess opened her eyes and looking at the prince as if he was no stranger said it is you my prince i know you for the fairy has sent me such happy dreams in order that i might know the one who should free me from enchantment then they talked together each had so much to say the prince forgot the flight of time and the princess certainly did it was so long since she had talked with any one meanwhile the whole castle had awakened when the princess did and all the people had returned to their regular duties they were naturally half starved dinner was prepared then the maid of honor who was as hungry as the others and who really had difficulty to keep her voice from being as sharp as her appetite went to the princess's apartment and said in a gentle tone pardon your highness but dinner is served the princess was superbly dressed and the prince was careful not to say that her robe was like that of his great-grandmother he did not find her any less beautiful for all that they dined in the hall of mirrors and were served by the pages and ladies-in-waiting of the princess the violins and hot-boys played delightfully considering that they had lain untouched for a hundred years after dinner the prince and princess were married in the chapel of the castle and on the death of the prince's father which occurred soon after the marriage the prince and princess reigned happily over all that land End of chapter fifty nine